let's learn all about Earl Stanley Gardner today. And then we'll make it a YouTube show and a whatnot show. Yeah. Oh, it's all coming together. The way I won't be bored sitting here. I got a book over there. It's called uh, Careless Cupid. Let me grab it. So this is the book I'm talking that is inspiring today's learn about an author. Uh, it's The Case of the Careless Cupid. I'll, let me turn this off. Case of the Careless Cupid, Earl Stanley Gardner. I think this is the first. I don't know. This is probably something we should learn today, to be honest, is what, what his first editions look like, right? Um, were I don't know if they were released because as pulp first because I've seen pulp from him. This is from 1968. I'm sure he kept writing after the pulp era. Um, so yeah, let's get a timeline on like the release dates of his books, which I think is actually useful information. Um, and then uh, and then maybe we'll watch an interview or two of this guy and just kind of get a feel for like who he's about, what's he is about. And of course, I grew up with Perry Mason, like at Nick at Night. Like I'm like, is that right? Is that is that fair to say we had Perry Mason on it like late night TBS and shit, Ash? So, yeah, yeah. So this is a genre that has not a ton of nostalgia, but not no nostalgia. <laughs> so that's the picture of the guy there. Anyway, so let's let's see what we're doing first, because I'm I'm, I'm, I'm practical before I'm anything else. Let's look up his books. Perry, ooh, here we go. HBO gets Perry Mason mostly right. The pulpy roots of the mystery series. That's probably worth watching. Let's watch this guy. Perry Mason exists in the public's imagination as a paragon of lawyerly skill and virtue. Okay. Based on decades of popular radio, film, and television. I like this guy's voice. Iconic character. But is that how he was Will you check my audio to see what the balance is like? In the case of the Velvet Claws. I'm not going to watch it from the beginning, though. I didn't hear a word this guy said. Over the Sorry. Perry Mason exists in the public's imagination as a paragon of lawyerly skill and virtue. Based on decades of popular radio, film, and television portrayals of the iconic character. But is that how he was originally written by his creator, Earl Stanley Gardner? Welcome to the library ladder. Perry Mason is perhaps the most famous fictional trial lawyer of all time. He specialized in representing criminal defendants with seemingly unwinnable cases. And through ingenuity, cagey lawyering, and the help of his legal secretary, Della Street, and a private investigator, Paul Drake, he managed to emerge victorious in nearly every one of those cases. He was created by Earl Stanley Gardner and made his debut in The Case of the Velvet Claws, published in 1933. Okay. Over the next 40 years, Gardner published 81 additional Perry Mason Damn, novels. Dude. And for several decades, it was the best-selling book series of all time. Today, it ranks as the... So one thing I want to point out here is, like, like he was, like, right in that pulp era. You know what I mean? Like, he just really... That's awesome. Good for him. He was, like, alive at the perfect time. Third best-selling series ever behind only the Harry Potter and Goosebumps books. Didn't know that. Gardner's Perry Mason novels were an instant success, with several of his early ones adapted by Hollywood into movies almost as soon as the books were published. A popular radio series featuring the character aired from 1943 to 1956, after which it was transformed into the long-running television soap opera, The Edge of Night. However, the most popular and enduring image of the character today is the version portrayed by Raymond Burr in the Perry Mason television show. This is this is what we grew up on, right, babe? That ran from 1957 to 1966, and has so it was on a like Nick at Night or whatever. syndication ever since. Several generations who might not have read Gardner's novels. So I apologize. This is not the version. My version had an old guy, or am I thinking a Matlock? So I think there's another version from the 80s that I'm thinking about, but I, I could be wrong. I've nevertheless been inspired to pursue legal careers after watching Burr's Perry Mason perform his Oh, that music, dream. though. <laughs> Countless budding lawyers aspired to have the confidence, poise, cleverness, ethical rigor, and calmly urbane demeanor of Burr's Mason. But is that how Gardner originally wrote the character? Short answer, no, not really. Really? In the books, most of what we know about Mason is gleaned from his actions rather than from a detailed description of him. 
Only the very first book, The Case of the Velvet Claws, provides substantial clues to how Gardner initially envisaged the character. In it, Mason is described essentially as a street brawler with a law degree. He's burly, physically intimidating, hot-tempered, and prone to fisticuffs, My or guy. at least aggressive <laughs> threats to punch an antagonist. He's also ethically very flexible. His approach to representing criminal defendants is almost Machiavellian in his embrace of legally and ethically questionable tactics to win a not guilty verdict for his clients. He lies to law enforcement so authorities. he's not a, a good guy, with necessarily. And sometimes manufactures false evidence to obstruct police investigations. He bribes authorities for inside information or access to evidence. He engages in improper ex parte communications with judges and he has clear conflicts of interests in his simultaneous representation of multiple persons involved in his cases. In other words, he's an anti-hero straight out of the crime pulp magazines of that era. To him, a little misconduct is perfectly acceptable in pursuit of his client's interest in avoiding jail or the electric chair. Had he engaged in those kinds of actions today, he would have risked his own arrest and disbarment as well as numerous malpractice lawsuits for his cavalier attitude toward the risks he imposes on his clients. Nevertheless, Perry does whatever it takes to win his cases, and he justifies it by arguing that the police and the district attorney's office are even more unethical than he is. His operating assumption is that most law enforcement officials play dirty by many- Other people doing wrong is never an excuse for our own wrongdoing. Ever. You are responsible for your own choices and behavior. Two wrongs don't make a right. However, three lefts do. Let's keep it real. Manufacturing evidence, coercing confessions, and in various other ways stacking the deck against criminal defendants. He rationalizes his actions by arguing that he's simply trying to level the playing field by using similar tactics. This was a clear expression of the ethos found in many of the <laughs> crime pulps at that time, which oh, isn't oh, surprising yeah, yeah. since Gardner got his literary start writing short stories for cheap crime and mystery magazines such as Game World, Dime Detective Magazine, and Detective Fiction Weekly. Keep in mind that this was decades before landmark legal rulings by the U.S. Supreme Court established basic rights for criminal defendants, such as the right to remain silent, and the right to have a lawyer present when questioned in police custody. Police and prosecutorial abuse were rampant back then. Gardner rampant. had first-hand knowledge and experience with that unfortunate side of the law. In his day job, Gardner was a practicing trial attorney who frequently sought out and represented clients. Oh, I didn't who know he was an actual lawyer. Or otherwise unable to defend themselves That's against interesting. the law enforcement process that routinely railroaded them to jail without a fair trial. In fact, in the 1940s, he founded the Court of Last Resort in Southern California, the first nonprofit organization in the U.S. dedicated to advocating on behalf of the wrongly convicted. It was a precursor. Okay, that's rad. Like, I didn't know he did that. I just thought he wrote books. I didn't know he was like an active like advocate for justice. ...to later organizations and initiatives such as the Innocence Project. Look at this guy! Over the course of the first decade of the book series, Gardner's Perry Mason character gradually evolves into something more closely resembling his popular image today. Some of that evolution can be attributed to the rising popularity of detective fiction featuring sympathetic and ethical sleuths created by Golden Age mystery writers such as Agatha Christie and sure. Hillary Queen. Gardner recognized the trend and hopped on board. Ellery Queen will be another one that will do this with. I, I know like very little about him. I don't even know if El Ellery is a guy's name, right? I assume. Some Ashley. of the change might also have been the result of a growing push. That's right, right, right. My wife's name is Ashley, which could be either or too. So, you know. Which Gardner sought to promote. And some of Mason's character shift likely occurred in response to reader expectations created by the Perry Mason movie and radio adaptations of the 1930s and 40s. You see, those film and radio productions reached far larger audiences than did the original books on which sure. they were based. So most potential readers of the series were primed to expect book Perry Mason to 
be much like his portrayal on the silver screen. Right. And you want to meet those expectations. Now, like, his or- and as a person who's like, they have to like pay people to bring that book to market. So they're going to write the book that's going to sell. And you know what I mean? That's why you see James Patterson books everywhere. Early film portrayals were not very consistent or very good. And they were significantly different from the books. Popular 1930s leading man Warren William played Mason in several of the films, and he was badly miscast, in my opinion. I think of Warren William as the American equivalent of English actor Basil Rathbone, who I know famously none of these played people. Sherlock Holmes in several films. Both actors convey airs of snooty, cultured elitism, which is a far cry from the rough and tumble origins and persona of Gardner's Perry Mason. Even worse, following the massive success of the 1934 film adaptation of Dashiell Hammett's The Thin Man, the producers of the Perry Mason films tried to recreate the magic of Nick and Nora Charles by transforming Mason's character into a comical, lovable lush who marries his long-suffering secretary, Della Street, who then tries to keep him upright and on track. It really didn't work, and the film adaptations deviate substantially from the plots of the Perry Mason novels on which they're based, but audiences at the time ate it up, resulting in... I think that is funny, though, because as, as book readers, we still struggle with film adaptations. Even as comic book people, we, we still struggle with Hollywood taking a different path to water it down or, or whatever. They are. It's just, it's interesting that, and of course it would be, but... It's interesting that this has been a problem since, like, movie started. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just interesting. Six Perry Mason films from 1934 to 1937. Humans are the same. Other characters in the books the also shit. evolve over time. Della Street, Mason's legal secretary, is initially portrayed in the books as highly intelligent and possessing more people-savvy and common sense than Mason does. Mason really relies on her, and she's instrumental in helping him think through problems and assess people and situations. A proper heroine, a she's capable like heroine. A partner to Mason. However, after the first couple of books, Della loses much of her individuality and sense of agency, Brummer. and she becomes more of a prop that Gardner and Mason use merely to advance the plot. Sorry, I suspect this shift in Della's character well, was partly influenced by her shallow film portrayals. He wrote, he wrote I also wonder if Gardner worried about like showing Mason in a less like than perfect light. Della was an effective foil for Mason's character flaws in the early books, but as Mason gradually transformed <laughs> from a scrappy fighter into a polished super lawyer, it appears that Gardner eliminated aspects of Della's character that undermined Mason's idealized image. A similar thing happened to Paul Drake, the private investigator Mason frequently retains for assistance on cases. In the early books, Drake is very independent and somewhat mistrustful of Mason and his legally and ethically dubious practices. Drake doesn't want to lose his investigator's license, and their relationship is far more transactional than friendly. Again, over time, Drake's character gradually changes to become a regular comrade and compatriot of Mason, sometimes bending the rules in order to keep Mason's own hands and reputation clean. These character shifts culminated in the long-running television series from the 1950s and 60s starring Raymond Burr as Mason, in which Mason is perpetually calm, cool, and collected. Della is the supportive but typically not very consequential secretary and Drake is practically a business partner and best friend of Mason. I grew up watching... I do want to point out how cool it is to, like, get these, like, to understand more of such a larger world because, like, I come across a lot of references to things and, like, hearing who the secretary is, who the who the detective is, and all these different things make other things make sense when you start to see the larger... You know, besides just the title character. So I think it's neat. My whole, you know, because I see these books everywhere all of the time. Syndicated reruns of episodes from the 1950s Perry Mason TV show, and it formed my initial mental image of the characters. When I later discovered the Perry Mason books as an adult, I Those was are gorgeous a little books. dismayed to find Mason as flawed as he was, particularly in the early books. But I also enjoyed So the mine does not look like an, it's just a BCE. A perspective I mean, that, those look... More recently, HBO Pretty created great. a 2020 adaptation starring Matthew Reese as Mason. This limited series is far closer to the original version of Gardner's Perry Mason character than any other. 
I'll have to it check that out. It takes a few liberties with Mason's backstory and motivations, filling in some of the gaps in Gardner's very sparse character descriptions. But it also presents Mason as scrappy, combative, and flawed, and willing to cut ethical corners to help his client, much like Mason does in the early books. The show has a very seedy and pulpy feel to it, which fits with the early books. So, getting back to the books, are they any good? And are they worth reading by modern This audiences? guy's slider work is on point. In a nutshell, yes. The mysteries at the heart of most of the books are surprisingly good and well thought out. Many of the books seem like a cross between a modern legal thriller by John Grisham or Greg Isles, a golden age locked okay, mystery. Okay, so that's who Greg Isles is. I got a John mountain Nixon of his books in the garage. And crime stories from the pulp magazines. In I tone, love the pulp style and dialogue. The early books are more akin to pulpy legal thrillers, while the later books are clearly influenced by Agatha Christie plots, such as Manor House Mysteries. The basic plots tend to follow a similar formula. Mason is approached by a prospective client. A murder occurs. The client is accused of the crime and faces overwhelming evidence against them. Mason then searches for new evidence to exonerate his client. And a courtroom showdown demonstrating Mason's brilliance <laughs> concludes the story. The description of legal procedure and analysis is quite detailed and pretty accurate for the time period. Gardner, through Mason, provides a good primer on the adversarial primer. nature of trial advocacy. <laughs> Also, the mystery elements in the books generally follow Ronald Knox's rules of Golden Age mystery fiction, most notably the requirement that readers be presented all the evidence needed to solve the crime on their own. Sometimes Gardner hides Mason's plans and legal stratagems from readers so that Mason can pull a proverbial rabbit out of the hat in the climactic courtroom scene, but I rarely felt cheated by those tricks by the author. The underlying evidence was generally always available. Finally, the books can be read in any order. They're essential. I do find that interesting because it, like, now that they've he's put words to like the intent of that, like a lot of authors use that. Like, like Sherlock usually wraps up his stuff like that. All the information was out there, but we just didn't know the strings and how everything was relevant to each other. And of course, there's always that big aha moment. It's interesting that that concept has been around for ever you know it's interesting actually standalones although sometimes with opening again and closing slider work on point this guy the i like him. and next books in the series i recommend starting at the very beginning and reading in chronological Case. order the first four or five books in the series to get a good sense of see this is the kind of stuff that's really really important for me as someone who who finds these books and keeps these books and everything is because I need to know what the earlier ones versus the, the, the newer ones might be. So, cause you can't save everything. And sometimes you have to decide quickly. And the more I can shove in my brain, the better I'm going to be on the, on site, you know? So this is good. So what do we got? We got case of the lucky legs, case of the velvet claws, case of the howling dog, case of the something girl and the case of the curious bride. All right. Where Perry Mason started as a character. From there, feel free to skip around in the series. These are fun, quick reads that make great palate cleansers between the Page kinds turners. of long and weighty tomes commonly found in other genres. I hope you found this overview of the Perry Mason mystery novels helpful. I'll have more videos featuring the golden age of mystery stories coming in the future. Feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Okay, so number one, this dude gets a subscribe. What's this? Mystery guest. Okay. Let's give this a shot. <laughs> What's up, Chris? Good to see you. What's my line? Brought to you by Helene Curtis, makers of Stop F deodorants, blowing cream, spray, and stick. Suave hairdressing and end and dandruff treatment shampoo. Now let's all play What's My Line? And now let's meet our award-winning What's My Line panel. First, the popular columnist whose voice of Broadway appears in papers from coast to coast, Miss Dorothy Kilgallen.
our guest panelist, who is a star of radio, television, and the screen, best of all, the voice of Mr. Magoo, Jim Backus. Thank you. And on my left, I used to room with a fellow called Martin Gable. I'd like to introduce his current roommate, Miss Arlene Francis. <laughs> You trained him very well, Jim. Thank you, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> and to my left, a gentleman who makes his wife very happy, who makes his friends very happy, and now he's made my son very happy by giving him all those marvelous landmark books. Mr. Bennett, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if, if you notice a great change in the panel tonight, it's because Dorothy has suddenly appeared with beautiful black hair. <laughs> Over yonder there is a very, very famous news analyst and panel moderator, so famous he needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him any. It's Daly. <laughs> Bennett's a little unsettled tonight. He went up to Lum Fung's for dinner and got one of those Chinese fortune cookies, <laughs> and it said, congratulations, you now have Asian flu. <laughs> That's Bennett's joke, I rush to say. Bennett's joke, he told it to me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to What's My Line. And because everything is a little bit different this year, and we're having August weather in the middle of September, we'll be different. No, we're doing that now, too, are we? Please. What's up, Miss Birdie? We'll What's up, Oxtail? We'll mystery guest before our panel a bit later in the show. We'll meet our first challenger in just one minute. All right, panel, are the blindfolds all in place? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Will our first challenger come in and sign in, please? And that's who we're watching today, our real Stanley Gardner. Author of Perry Mason, all that stuff. Uh, if the panel is aware of the fact that they have their uh, masks on for a reason, the reason being that there's an area of identification around here that uh, could be costuming, could be handwriting, could be uh, any number of things. Now that you're blindfolded, I wonder if our guest would be good enough to tell us if uh, the scoring system is familiar. Yes, sir. All right, on that basis, let's let everybody at home and our friends here in the theater know exactly what your line is. All right, panel, I will tell you that our guest is self-employed, and let's begin the general questioning with Dorothy Kilgallen. Are you a native of the United States? Oh, I see. It's like 20 questions. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that we are masked because someone on this panel would recognize you on sight, you rather than your uniform or whatever your dress is? That's possible. Uh, have you ever met anyone on this panel? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> have I ever met you? As Miss Kilgallen asks if she has ever met you. Uh, I think so. <laughs> you sound rather unforgettable. Uh, yeah, your face is familiar, anyway. Do you appear before the public in your work? Occasionally. Does it have anything to do with sports? No. One down and nine to go, Mr. Beckers. Uh, would do you... Five to one odds they don't get it right. I don't think so. Two down and eight to go, Miss Francis. There you go. <laughs> do you have anything to do in any way with any entertainment medium? Yes. Uh, could it possibly be the television medium? Indirectly. Uh, instead of appearing on camera, would you be somebody that is behind the scenes? Has he gone behind? <laughs> yes. Yes? That would be, yes, I think properly so that you're not misled that um, the answer might be indirectly again. Mm -hmm. Do you write? Uh, yes. I would love to see folks do this now. Have you written anything that's ever been published by Bennett Cerf? 
I think not. That makes it three. Woe is, <laughs> <laughs> is you. Woe is you. Have you ever had your name on a book that's been published? Yes. Uh, on, uh, yes, yes. You have. Yes. Has it been a book that's been published within the past two or three years? Yes. Two, uh, um, yes, yes. <laughs> This is, is Perry Mason, the guy who wrote Perry Mason. Bestseller when it came at out. the top of his career. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> it was not published by me. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to meet Bennett Cerf, who publishes only bestsellers. <laughs> was the book nonfiction? Uh, it was fiction, yes. Yeah. It was fiction. It was fiction. Well, that then I'm wrong. No, Bennett. Mm -hmm. That's four down and six to go, Miss Kilgallen. Now, you oh, I love this show. Your name was on the book. That isn't a sneaky way of saying that you're not an author, is it? Yeah. Are, are you? Well, I'll ask that in yeah, a different way, if I may. Frame, frame the question more uh, directly. Darling. Do you write yourself rather than publish, as Bennett does? Uh, yes, I, uh, I write. Yes. <laughs> Just and a it, little and bit. And you write fiction. <laughs> you write fiction. Yes. Did Bennett establish that this was not a novel? No, I believe nothing in that line oh. has been established. Do you write prose? No. Rather than poetry? Uh, yes. Have you ever lived south of the Mason-Dixon line? Ever lived south of the Mason-Dixon line? Mm -hmm. uh, Couldn't even tell you what that is, where that line is. <laughs> Good night. I pass. <laughs> Mr. Baggett? <laughs> Was, uh, were you the subject of a, uh, uh, either you might call it a, a profile or an article in a rather magazine with a large circulation recently? Mm, what do you mean by recently? <laughs> I'll be very coy and <laughs> hedge a little. Uh, the last three months. Uh, no. That makes it five down and five to go, Miss Francis. This book that you wrote, was it made into a picture? Was this book Several. that you wrote made into a picture? Uh, yes. <laughs> Has the picture already, uh, already been released? Yes. Is it a smash? If anybody wants to see anything or wants to look at anything, feel free to shout. This is I'm just hanging out, working, d doing the shipping from the weekend sales and stuff. So um, everything's in the shop. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. So the context for this moment in time is it's my understanding that that he's like this is they're actively making his movies like they have lobby cards probably in the place that they went in to film this thing, which is why this is hilarious. And I don't know if he really talks like that or if he's disguising his voice to 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 hide his identity. So I was hoping to see an interview to get like. But this is this is this is quite nice. Now that's I, I won't ask you that. Of course it was a smash. Or what would you be doing on what's my line? That's fair. Uh, <laughs> did you? Uh, is this uh, a, a comedy? Um, Yesish, no. but noish. Six down and four to go, Mr. Sir. Have any of your books ever been published in the Modern Library series? Mm, no. Seven down and three to go, Miss Kilgallen. Do you now or have you... So that's funny, too, is book people. I think I'm in the book ch uh, uh, channel right now, but we see a lot of modern libraries. It's those, like, uh, like Greybound or they're kind of beige-looking. They have, like, the red symbol on the front of them, and they're, like, 40s, 50s, 60s mostly. I think they might be a little bit even later than that. But it's interesting to hear them referenced in the time that they would have been popular which is which is really neat so i think this this whole thing is just really really fantastic what's up raf rafa rabello frontier collectible real chill stream we're probably really different from everybody else on whatnot and that's okay um we're just kidding i'm sitting here watching this i have 75 items up in the shop happy to bundle happy to discount um i'm doing work watching youtube hanging out live with y'all so what's up no money manny let's go back to this we're watching who what's my line a game show with Earl Stanley Gardner, um, who is the author of the Perry Mason series. So before this, we watched kind of a background 
in a bio on him, which was really interesting. I'll, I'll have to post. It was a really good video, too, to be honest. Ever worn a beard? Do you now or have you ever worn a beard? I dig the hair. <laughs> um, no. Slicked back. That makes it eight down and two to go, Mr. Beckett. Would you classify yourself uh, as, shall we say, one of the ten foremost novelists? I would, but Mr. Surf wouldn't. <laughs> we will consider the question answered affirmatively. Mr. Backus, continue. Uh, does, do you deal with novels, shall we say, of a rather vigorous nature, the subject mm -hmm. matter? Yes, sir. Oh, boy. Uh, Oh, I love it. Uh, but figures, have have you uh, have you uh, uh, the, uh, let's see a picture of one of your novels playing either on Broadway or currently throughout the country? That's a good question. Is a picture made, made from, from, from your one novel. of your novels currently playing on Broadway or throughout the country, which covers quite a bit of ground? I haven't been up Broadway since uh, quite a while. I guess that gives you a no. That's nine down, one to go, Mr. You don't know. That's not a no. Uh, <clears throat> do you write historical novels? Ten down and no more to go. Hysterical and novels, I meant. Hysterical <laughs> novels? No, historical, no. Earl Stanley Gardner. Oh! oh. <laughs> and this guy's probably like, duh. <laughs> well, sir, Mr. Perry Mason. Or rather, the father of Perry Mason. It's always a joy to stick the panel. It's very nice of you to come and help us to do it. Well, it's a pleasure to meet, sir. Wonderful to have you with us, sir. Would you say goodnight to the panel? Well, you better say something about that Perry Mason show that's coming on CBS next Saturday. Or no sort of good part. All right, we'll go. Well, Stan, you got it. That's cool. Perry Mason is now going to be on CBS. Mr. Gardner says beginning next Saturday. And now let's see what we can do about sticking the panel again. It's a lovely night. So will our next challenger come in and sign in, please? Honestly, I kind of just want to keep watching this. <laughs> if we know this guy, person. V. Toriano. All right, I have no right? idea who that is. <laughs> Back to Earl Stanley. Switzerland, Saint Maurice. 